The Dwarves are one of the most technologically gifted factions in the game, and they take great advantage of this while in combat. Their roster is full of units with nearly impenetrable armour, massive firepower and explosive damage. They may not be the fastest moving of the rosters, but once they get their feet planted, they can be very difficult to move. First, let's go over the pros and cons of the roster overall. First of all the pros, they have a ton of missile units both infantry and artillery that will devastate enemies from across the entire map if you can keep them safe. They also have ridiculously tough front lines units with great armor stats right out the gate, making them very hard to get rid of and get past. And finally they can make use of that runic lore of magic that costs no wins and can be used on cooldown for every caster you bring, adding up to potentially dozens of casts per battle. As for the cons, they are super slow on the whole, with even their fastest units not being able to catch up to even the slowest of enemies. This combined with their strong reliance on ranged units makes them very vulnerable to being flanked, and if they are, it can spell doom for the entire battle. Their lords and heroes don't really have a lot of impact most of the time, other than providing encouragement and buffs here and there to other units whilst remaining fairly useless themselves. Now just before we get into the units, there is one thing that is unique to the roster. The entire roster has 35% spell resistance for all units, so if enemies relying on casters, you can rest easy knowing you'll take a lot less damage than normal. Right, now let's get into the units, starting with the lords, and first up we have Thorgrim and Grudgebearer. Thorgrim is heavily armoured, is a melee expert and has magical attacks. He is one of the tankiest lads in the game with his massive armour stats, resistances and a huge HP pool. This makes him extremely difficult for enemies to get rid of, so he's perfectly happy on the front lines, as long as he doesn't totally get surrounded by armour piercing. Speaking of which, his damage does not have a lot of it, so against tougher foes he will struggle quite a bit. Against resistance he does well with his magic, but aside from that he wants to stick to less armoured targets to make sure the majority of his damage is being felt. Stick him in the middle of your front lines and find targets like this for him to focus on while keeping an eye on him to make sure he doesn't dive too deep and get swarmed. His leadership buffs will keep his allies around him for a very long time if you can keep him alive. Next we have Ungrim Iron Fist. He's armoured and a melee expert and deals armour piercing damage. He has charge defence versus large and has unbreakable leadership. Ungrim is of course the Slayer King and looking at his stats it's pretty clear to see why. He has a huge attack stats with massive armour piercing and anti-large damage so can take on pretty much anything and cause some serious hurt in the process. On top of this he's also pretty tanky with his brilliant armour and great defence stats. He's Lord you want to send straight into the front lines against pretty much anything and he'll come out on top. Of course a ton of high damage will cause him some trouble so avoid that if you can, but other than that you can send him pretty much anywhere and he will fight hard to the bitter end. To get the most out of him you can focus on any large targets to trigger that bonus damage and he'll do great work for you. Not really a bad way to use him, just send him in and try not to let him fulfil that Slayer Oath. Next we have Belgar Ironhammer, he's armoured and shielded, a melee expert and comes with charge defence versus all. And he also starts with the Mighty Oath Stone ability. Belagar is maybe tied with Thorgrim for just how tanky he is. Yes, he has less HP, but he's also a small hitbox and has a silver shield, so it's nearly impossible to damage with ranged fire, especially with the resistance. Sadly, tankiness is pretty much where his usefulness ends, since his damage isn't massively armor piercing, so against late game units, he won't do much. All he can really do is get into the middle of your front lines and do some mid damage whilst encouraging nearby allies. Don't let him get in too deep as he can still die despite his toughness and focus on less armoured foes when you can to maximise his damage. Next up we have Grum Brindle, the White Dwarf. He's armoured and a melee expert and deals armour piercing magical damage and has the Grum Brindle has no fear ability. Grum Brindle is the best fighting lord on the dwarf roster and one on one possibly one of the best in the game. He's incredibly tough with amazing armour, pretty tasty HP and even great defence. That damage of his is also absurd, with a stupid 70 melee attack, magical and armor piercing damage, meaning pretty much nothing can ignore his damage unless they've got ward save. He can go against pretty much anything in front lines combat, whether it's infantry, other lords and heroes, and even monsters. With stats like this, he can really do it all. The only downside to him is his speed, but if he can pin a unit down, there isn't much escape in the White Dwarf. Toss him into the front lines versus the most valuable targets you can find, and watch him pop off. The only thing you need to worry about is him getting carried away and surrounded by high damage foes. And our final legendary lord is Thoric Ironbrow. He has access to runic magic, is armoured and has magical attacks. In general combat, Thoric is honestly pretty good. He's got great armour and HP as well as decent melee stats and strong armour piercing damage. Yes his melee stats aren't amazing, but against most units he'll do just fine as long as they aren't super elite. But of course the front lines isn't really his real power. That's of course his runes. You want to unlock these as soon as you can in the skill tree and use them to keep your units buffed and enemies debuffed and on fire if you can manage it. These are a weird set of spells but they can be pretty strong and a lot of fun so use them on cooldown for free value. Again, the only thing you really need to worry about here is him getting surrounded by armor piercing damage so keep him fighting by your troops and using those runes and he should be just fine. He also comes with one mount, the Anvil of Doom. This doesn't really change his stats but gives him some physical resistance as well as a couple of abilities, Rune of Doom and Locus of Power. Our first generic lord is the Lord. He's armoured and shielded and a melee expert and comes with charge defence versus all. 
These are super basic frontlines lords, kind of like a weaker Belagar. They have a ton of armor and great defense, so are super tough to get rid of, but outside of this, they don't do a lot. Their damage isn't very armor piercing, so against tougher targets, they're going to struggle, so using them for damage past the early game isn't going to get much done. Just toss them into the front lines versus the lowest armor you can find and keep them there to encourage your units, and that's just about all they can do. And our other generic lord type is the rune lords. These, of course, have access to runic magic and are armored. These are a little like Thoric, but without any of the damage that makes them effective on the front lines. They still have the same runes to use in combat to assist the army and disrupt the enemy, but aside from that, they don't have a lot going for them. They still have tough armor, but their melee stats and damage are incredibly poor, so using them on the front lines is pretty pointless and sometimes outright dangerous depending what they're up against. Keep them close, but not into the front lines, and use their runes on cooldown whenever you can to provide value outside of just standing there. And they also have access to the same Anvil of Doom mount as Belagar. Now come to our heroes, and we first have the four ancestral heroes of Clan Angrund. First up, we have Dramat Hammerfist. He's a ballistics expert, which means he improves all nearby missile units with abilities unlocked by the skill tree. He also deals armor piercing damage and is ethereal, which grants him frostbite and magical attacks, as well as physical resistance. And he, of course, causes terror. Now, the main use of this guy is to level him up as fast as possible to unlock all of the skills and buffs of ranged units in your army. Once he has everything online, he can catapult your ranged units from being pretty top tier to absolutely broken overpowered. We're talking more strength, ammo, and just about anything else they need to deal damage on a massive scale. So grind levels and sit near your ranged units to help them out. As for Dramar himself and his actual combat use, he's pretty good in both melee and ranged, though ranged is of course the best option. He has great range and huge missile strength, so can do great damage to units from quite a ways off. This damage is also magical and armor piercing, so can punch through any defenses an enemy might have. It is of course in a straight line to get him a good angle on his targets and he'll tear them to bits. In melee he still has armor piercing and magical damage and now the added frostbite effect to slow units down and make it that much harder for them to get away alive. Their melee stats aren't the best but they will still stay there till the end with the unbreakable leadership. Of course they have no armor and instead rely on resistance so keep them away from magical damage if you can otherwise they will go down very fast. I would say keep them in ranged combat and nearby to other troops for those buffs and abilities, and only use melee as a last resort as it really is a bit of a waste of their talents. Next up we have King Lun Ironhammer. He's shielded, ethereal, and causes terror. As a Thane, this guy is best used to take on other single targets in one-on-one -on -one duels. His stats reflect this with his great melee stats and pretty top-tier weapon strength with the armor-piercing magical and frostbite attacks. Of course, being limited to melee does put him at considerable risk, especially if the enemy has magical since physical resistance just isn't as good as it used to be. See if you can get him into combat versus other lords and heroes, but be sure to pull him out at the first sign of danger, as even with the unbreakable leadership, he won't last long once he starts to fail. Honestly, not much more to say. These are basic combat heroes, so use them in basic combat whilst avoiding magical damage. Next, we have Throny Ironbrow. He has access to runic magic, is ethereal, and causes terror. In basic combat, Throny will perform about as well as King Lun. He has worse melee stats but better damage, so overall will do just as well in the same combat scenarios. The real difference here is that Throny is a runesmith, so has access to all those lovely spells from the Law of Runic Magic. You want to keep him alive so you can spam these on cooldown to assist your army whenever needed. Of course, these runes have cooldowns specific to their caster, so having more than one runesmith means more runes at any time. Sit him in a safe spot and take part in any safe combat you can, whilst casting as much as possible. Not much more to him than that. Next we have Hulk and Half Stonebeard. He's shielded, ethereal, and causes terror. This lad functions more or less the same as King Lund Ironhammer. Yes, they have a few minor stat changes like Hulk and Half being slightly tankier, but on the whole they'll do the same job about as well as each other, so use them pretty much the same and you'll be just fine. Next up we have the Thanes, and these are armored and shielded. These lads are super similar to the two legendary Thanes we just covered, but trade the physical resistance for a massive amount of armor, so much tougher versus most forms of damage. They also lose quite a lot of their own damage however, so just end up being tanky on a unit filled with already tanky units. I honestly don't like using Thanes in combat, so I wouldn't, but if you had to, then throw them into the front lines versus low armor targets to make sure their damage gets through. At least then you have your front lines feel the benefits of their presence, and they might pick up a kill or two here and there. Next we have the runesmiths, and these of course have access to runic magic and are armored. Again, the same as the Thanes, these runesmiths are very similar to Throny, but lose damage and resistance for more armor. Other than that, they can be used more or less the same, maybe throw them into the front lines if the enemy has something weak, but focus on keeping them alive and casting as a priority. And finally we have the Master Engineers. These are ballistics experts, armored, and deal armor piercing damage. And again, very similar to Dramar, but trades the resistance for armor. He still keeps some nice armor piercing damage, so can still do great damage from range down in melee, but wants to be used pretty much the same. Keep him at the back and firing, whilst buffing units with his abilities. Now we come to the melee infantry. First up we have the miners. These are a tier 1 unit, are armored, deal armor piercing damage, and are powerful versus gates. Miners are honestly pretty useless if you ask me. 
Yes, they have 80 armor and some armor piercing damage, but their melee stats are just so terrible that nothing else really matters. The moment they get into combat with anything even halfway decent, they're going to slowly fall apart as nearly every attack makes its way through their defenses and chips away at their HP, even through their thick armor. The only way I would see using them would be to use the Vanguard to hide and then sandwich enemy lines once they've come to meet you, but that wouldn't be very dowy of you and you might get thrown in the book if you're not careful. I avoid miners as much as possible, so only go for them if I really have no other choice. The only thing they're really good at is hacking gates to pieces, so if you've got an early siege and can't afford to wait for towers, then send them in to take that thing down. They also come in another variation, Blasting Charge Miners. These are a tier 1 unit, are armoured, deal armour piercing damage, are strong versus gates, and now come with a ranged weapon. These are the exact same unit, but they now have a single Blasting Charge per Dwarf that they can throw out. These have a very short range, so are normally tossed just as combat is about to clash, and these can do some decent, if not overly armour piercing damage. If you're going to insist on taking miners, then you might as well take these lads. They're the exact same, but now come with explosions, what's not to like. Next up we have Dwarf Warriors. These are a tier 1 unit, and are armoured and shielded, and have charged defence versus large. These are the reason there's no point going for miners. They're an actual front lines unit, and are one of the toughest lines you can find, and we're only just getting started with the Dowie. They have brilliant armour, defence and shields, so can shrug off most forms of damage with ease. Yes, their own damage is not insane, but it's passable, and for how long they'll stay in combat, it can quickly add up. Besides, with a unit like this, you want to keep enemies still and let the real damage be done by ranged troops. You're going to hear this a lot today, but their entire deal is to be a wall of beards and steel to keep the enemies away from your back lines to let them do all the real damage. There's not really a lot more to them than that, so set them up and keep them supported. They also come in another variation, Great Weapons Dwarf Warriors. These are now armoured and deal armour piercing damage. These drop the charge, defence, shields and defence for a little more attack, charge bonus and of course a bunch more armour piercing damage. This changes them from an iron wall into a meat grinder that wants to be fed units to chop to ribbons with their damage. Of course the drop in defence makes them a lot worse at holding the line, but they are now dealing damage so you can potentially get rid of enemies faster, so you'll likely end up about the same if you manage them right. I personally stick with regular warriors for the iron defence, but if you want to go full aggression and deal as much damage as possible in all areas, then by all means add armour piercing to your front lines and it'll do just fine. Next up we have long beards, these are a tier 2 unit, are armoured and shielded, have charged defence versus large, and are old grumblers, which means they have the encourage effect. These are essentially the direct upgrade to Dwarf Warriors. They gain improvements to basically all stats that matter to perform their job, as well as immune to psychology and the encourage ability we mentioned earlier. These are a very difficult unit to get rid of, and they take the Iron Wall of the Warriors to a new level with crazy toughness for a mid-game unit. That being said, the way you want to use them is pretty much identical. Turtle is the Dwarf playstyle, so set them up and have them hold foes back to give your ranged troops time to deal all the damage. There isn't really much more to say since they'll just sit there for a very long time and they're pretty hard to use wrong. They also come in another variation, Great Weapons Longbeards. These are another tier 2 unit, are armoured, deal armour piercing damage, have charge defence versus large and are old grumblers. A similar story to the warriors, they lose shields and defence for attack, charge bonus and a nice bit of armour piercing damage. The same advice also applies that they'll be less tanky but take out whatever's in front of them much quicker so the end result will be the same if you keep them well managed. I, again, prefer regular longbeards for the sustained tankiness but if you're looking for full damage across the board, they will provide it. Move them into position away from any ranged threats and send them in versus the most armoured tags you can to make the most of that damage and of course keep them supported with ranged units as much as possible. Next up we have Slayers, these are a tier 2 unit, have anti-large damage, are fast for a dwarf, have death blow which means imminent death only makes them fight harder and they will launch one final attack as they die. They also have whirling axes which can deflect incoming missiles with their axes even without shield and they are of course unbreakable. Finally, we get to the Slayers, who break up the regular Dwarf playstyle for something a little more aggressive and specific. Slayers are monster slayers and want to be used as such. If you use them like regular front lines, they will not do well with their lack of armour and mediocre damage without the bonus. If you get them on something large like Cav or Monsters, they will shred and take down things they really don't have any business taking down when you look at them. Since they have decent speed for Dwarves, I like to use them kind of like Cav units. This means I still have my regular front lines and hold these guys back to seek out key targets so once lines are set, move them in to get those large targets wherever they might be. Of course they'll stay until their last breath with that unbreakable leadership, just make sure that they're fighting something worthy of their slayer end when they do go down. They also come in another variation, Giant Slayers. These are a tier 3 unit and deal armour piercing anti-large damage, are still fast for a dwarf and still come with death blow and unbreakable. Giant Slayers drop the shields in favour of two handed great axes and gain increases to melee stats, charge bonus and armour piercing damage because of this. It doesn't really change how you want to use them however, as they are still best used versus large targets, but now can expand this to large targets with a bit of armour. Should avoid missiles a lot more, as they can quickly be picked apart from a range with their total lack of armour and any missile defence. Keep them back until lines clash and then send them in to take out those big boys. Avoid infantry and ranged and they'll do great. Next up we have Hammerers, these are a tier 3 unit, are armoured and deal armour piercing damage and are damage dealers. 
These are the top of the line if you're looking for a high damage dwarf from line. They have great armor and HP as well as brilliant melee stats so it can be pretty tough for most units to take out. They also deal great damage with their excellent attack, armor pacing and magical damage meaning they can break through anything whether it's resistance or armor. And yes, I know that hammers can punch through armor, you don't need to comment on that 3 year old video anymore, good god I'm old. Use them pretty much like you would the great weapons longbeards. Keep them on the front lines versus the highest armor targets you can find and avoid ranged fire whenever possible. Keep up the ranged spots to ensure they don't take too many hits in combat and they'll do great for you. Just be careful their lack of defense doesn't come to bite you. And our final melee infantry unit is the Ironbreakers. These are a tier 3 units, rammed and shielded, have a ranged weapon, have charged defense against all and their ranged weapon cannot be used against air. Now these may not have the damage of the hammers but good lord are they ever tanky. They have huge armor, a shield and an absolutely insane 66 defense not to mention the nearly 10,000 HP. Add on the expert charge defense and you have a unit that is just about immovable once they plant their feet. These are the end game wall for the dwarves and they excel at this job. They can hold back basically anything with their insane toughness and that's exactly what you want them to do. Set them up and have them hold foes back and move in ranged units to deal all the damage. Pretty much the same strat I've been using all this time but now they're even tougher. And the chariot on top of the very crunchy cake is their explosive charges they can launch. They're similar to blasting charges from miners but have double the ammo and a ton of damage so it can do some serious damage to units as they approach. You can hold on to them for key targets later in the fight but most of the time unless the enemy has a load of chaff leading the charge, leaving them on fire at will will do just fine to soften up whatever they're going to be up against just before the lines clash. Now we come to the ranged infantry starting with the rangers, these are a tier 1 unit, come with vanguard deployments and stalk and are fast for dwarves. Rangers got my award for the worst unit in the Dwarves roster and I stand by that judgement. They're really not that bad as they have fine range damage and arcing shots so will work great alongside a beefy front line in the early game. Their survivability isn't the best with their low armour for a dwarf unit and pretty terrible melee stats. You want to keep these guys out of danger as much as possible and have them fire from a safe location to assist the front lines in combat. Their vanguard and stalk is honestly just a big question mark for me. You could deploy them in a hidden location and have them fire to enemy back once the lines clash, but why would you do this? You can sit them behind your front lines and they will fire from safety just fine. Using them to flank just opens them up to more danger and even with their fast speed for a dwarf, most other factions will catch up to them no problem. If you're going to use them, leave them on the back lines. They also come in another variation, the Great Weapons Rangers. These are a tier 2 unit and have armor piercing damage, vanguard deployment, stalk and are faster dwarves. These lads swap the crossbows for throwing axes which grants them much more armor piercing damage at the cost of quite a bit of range. Now these guys are something I can see myself using to flank since their short range means they'll have a harder time firing over allies heads. You can either use their vanguard or just their speed to get into the flanks of enemy lines and fire freely into them for massive damage. You still want to be careful of letting them get pinned down in melee since their stats aren't amazing even with the added armor piercing damage. Not much more to say than that, just get them on the flanks and keep an eye out for danger and they should get pretty great value. Next up we have the Quarrelers, these are a tier 1 unit, are armoured and shielded and are decent melee combatants. These are pretty much the exact same as rangers but swap the vanguard and stalk for more ammo, defence, leadership and double the armour. This doesn't change how I would use them since I'd leave either of my back lines to fire over my front lines heads. The only change now is you don't even have the option to flank if you wanted to. That a tankiness is a nice touch and makes them a lot harder to take out with non armor piercing damage but still avoid melee combat at all costs since it really is a waste of their time if they have any ammo left. Just keep them back and safe and they'll do great work versus less armored targets. They also come in another variation, the Great Weapons Crawlers. These are a tier 2 unit, armored, decent melee combatants and now have armor piercing melee damage. These drop the shield and some defense in exchange for more attack, charge bonus and armor piercing weapon damage. This doesn't affect how they perform in ranged combat so only changes them if they happen to get caught in melee which I would still advise to avoid as much as possible. It causes them to deal more damage but also take more and I can't recommend this less. Keeping them alive to use their ammo should be your main priority so having these lads deal more melee damage is just bad investment in my opinion. Use them exactly the same as the base units only now they'll do more damage if they get caught in melee but avoid it as much as possible. Next we have Bugman's Rangers, these are a tier 2 units, come with vanguard deployment and stalk, a fast red dwarf and have charge defense versus large. These are a super weird unit, they have the exact same missile strength as basic Corollas and 2 less ammo but gain improvements to most of the stats. They also gain charge defense versus large, immune to psychology and even regeneration but are still the same range damage as Corollas with half the ammo. I wouldn't really use them myself since Corollas will do just fine if you keep them on the back lines and safe so upgrading to these guys will be a little bit pointless. Stick with the other later game ranged units and you'll have way more damage as long as you stick to the turtle playstyle. Next up we have Thunderers, these are a tier 2 units, armored and shielded, a decent melee combatants and have armor piercing missiles. Thunderers are an excellent unit with great damage in a straight firing arc. This does mean they need to have clear line of sight to fire which can be a hassle with the dwarves being so short. Getting them an angle on the flanks will ensure they can fire without the danger of hitting your own units. Just make sure to keep an eye out for enemy flankers coming to pick them off from their hazardous location. Their range damage is excellent and will tear most units to shreds no matter how much armor they might have. 
They're also great for focus firing single and large targets, especially since they'll be able to hit large foes from behind their own troops pretty easily. They want to avoid melee as much as possible, as even with their armor and shields, they will go down fast once pinned down by anything halfway decent. Get them an angle, keep them safe, and allow them to do what they do best. Next up we come to the Iron Drakes. These armored are an anti-infantry unit and have flaming and burnt infused attacks. Iron Drakes are a bit of a risky unit in pretty much every aspect. They need an angle on enemy lines, otherwise their friendly fire can be devastating. And even if they have this angle, their massive torrents of flame can sometimes come into contact with your own units and can sting quite a bit. Alongside this risky positioning, they also have terrible speed and pitiful melee stats, so won't be able to outrun anything and will lose combat to whatever manages to pin them down. The only saving grace is their armor, but later in the game it won't be enough to save them, so keep them defended as long as possible to avoid losing a lot of damage potential. Now their armor piercing damage ratio isn't the best, but honestly, they have that much raw dog missile strength that it does not matter. Against the most armored units in the game, they will still do great damage, so set them to fire on whatever front lines the enemy throws at you, and they'll do great. And yeah, infantry is their best target. With massive flaming explosions like this, they will literally melt entire units in seconds. They also come in another variation, the Trollhammer Torpedo Iron Drakes. These are a tier 2 units, are armored, have armor piercing missiles that deal anti large damage, but have a low rate of fire. This makes them into large targets annihilators as their massive damage can take down even the largest of enemies in just a few shots. Sadly, against anything that isn't a large target, they aren't quite as useful as their low rate of fire makes taking on large amounts of infantry a bit slow. Their damage will do just fine, but you might as well use the Thunderers or regular Iron Drakes for infantry, and you'll take out the same targets much faster. It's not so hard to recommend using a lot of these lads since they are so niche, but when you're up against a bunch of large targets, they do a great work for you. Sim at the back of your lines and fire over the heads of your front lines to hit large monsters if you can, otherwise just hop on a flank and get off as many volleys as you can safely get to get rid of those key targets. Now we come to the flying war machines, first up we have the Gyrocopter. This is a tier 2 unit, it's armoured and deals anti-infantry damage. It also has death from above, which means it can drop bombs onto the ground directly below them, and it also has poor accuracy. I want so desperately to love gyrocopters because they are honestly one of the coolest tech units in the game. Their range damage isn't too bad as long as they can hit their targets, and their bombs can do quite a bit of damage if you land them in the middle of an infantry blob, but none of these good things can forgive their truly pitiful survivability. For one, they are massive flying balls, so are easy targets for any ranged, and even with 100 armor, they will go down pretty bloody fast when targeted. Bring them onto the ground whenever you can to give them a little more cover and they'll survive a little bit better. However, if the enemy has flyers like harpies or fell bats or anything piss weak, just wave goodbye to them as they will go down in moments due to their honestly impressively low 6 defense. If there are no flyers on the enemy force, then just keep them clear of ranged fire and they should do okay. Just make sure to drop their bombs while all entities are alive to get the max value out of them that you can. We also have another variation, the Brimstone Gun Gyrocopters. These are a tier 2 unit, are armored, have armor piercing flaming missiles as well as anti-large damage and still have death from above. These are pretty much the exact same unit but gain buffs to their missile strength with flaming ammo, armor piercing and anti-large bonus damage. This makes them better at what they're good at, which is getting behind enemies to shoot them in the back. However, it still has all the same weaknesses as the original units, so getting caught out by flyers is a death sentence, and they're still a pretty big fat target for enemy ranged. If you can manage to keep them safe from both of these, then they can get some great value, but if not, then they're pretty much a waste of a unit. And again, drop bombs as soon as possible to get the most value possible that you can. Next we have the Gyro Bomber. These are a tier 3 units, Ramad, have armor piercing anti-infantry missiles, death from above, and suppressed imbued missiles. These single entities are basically gyrocopters, but with way more bombs and damage. Their titular bombing capability is pretty strong with a ton of uses that allow you to do one massive bombing run or a couple of smaller ones to deal devastating damage to all below, including your own units, so be careful of that. Their missile damage also sees a massive boost with armor piercing and the suppressed effect causing all enemies hit to be slowed and even easier it with follow up missiles. Your first priority should be dropping those bombs to get you off to a strong start, and once that's done, get them on a flank and fire into any key targets you can find. Their massive damage means almost anything is a valid target, so find whatever is the most dangerous to your army and fire away. Sadly, they still suffer the same weaknesses as the other two units, so if the enemy has flyers, you will have dyers, and if they have ranged, keep them estranged. And finally, we come to the artillery and war machines. First up, we have the bolt throwers. These are a tier 1 unit and deal armor piercing anti large damage. Everyone and their dog hates this unit and calls it useless, and while I don't totally agree, I'm not going to say this unit is great. They deal pretty decent armor piercing and anti-large damage over a huge range, so are pretty good at taking out large targets as long as they can land a shot. Against huge targets, they'll do great and deal a ton of damage, but versus early game units like infantry and such, they're kind of a little bit pointless. Combine all of this with the fact that they need line of sight to get off shots, and they just don't really do a ton. In the super early game, they'll do fine for taking out key large targets like huge monsters or lords and heroes, but once you get anything better, you should just replace them. The Dowie have no shortage of powerful ranged units, and these just don't happen to be one of them. Next up we have the Grudge Throwers. These are a tier 2 unit and have armor piercing anti-large missiles. Grudge Throwers are a unit that holds a special place in my heart. You just can't really beat a catapult, and this one is a beauty. It has a huge range and firing arc, so you can fire over units' heads no problem and hit the entire map if you need to. 
The damage is also pretty top notch, especially for such an early unit. You can target pretty much any front lines in the game, and they'll feel the hurt from the Grudge Thrower. Just set these bad boys up at the back of your lines and rain fire on approaching enemies. Infantry is their best shot as the impact and explosions will deal great damage in clumps. Larger targets are much harder to consistently hit, so leave them to other units until there's no more infantry left to crush. Next we have cannons. These are another tier 2 units and have armor piercing anti-large damage. Cannons are pretty similar to bolt throwers but have much more range and damage so do their job but so much better. They deal huge damage to large targets even without much in the way of anti-large bonus damage. Their huge armor piercing damage can punch through even the toughest defenses and will chip away at the meatiest HP bars in just a few short volleys. Of course they still have a flat firing arc, but from this massive range they can pick off key targets from half the map away, so if something reaches your lines, it should already be soft enough for your army to walk right over it. Over such a massive range they can miss a few times on smaller targets, so go for the bigs you can spot and they'll have a much better time of it. Next up we have organ guns, these are tier 3 units and have armour piercing missiles. These guys sacrifice some range from the cannons for a ton more armour piercing damage and a huge amount of missiles per volley. You can still use them to take out massive targets, especially with their newfound rapid firepower, but they're also now pretty good at taking out basically anything. Heavily armoured infantry will be ripped apart if you get a head on angle. Monsters of all sizes will feel the pain, even lords and heroes who are large enough to be hit will be taken out in moments. Walls and gates can also go down faster these lads. They still have the flat firing arc, so focus on hitting what you can first and foremost. Infantry is good in the approach before moving on to large targets once the lines clash. Just keep them firing at something and they'll deal a ton of damage and get you some great value. And finally, we have flame cannons. These are tier 3 units and deal anti-infantry damage as well as having flaming ammo and burnt infused attacks. These are very similar to the Iron Drakes in the sense that they have flaming and burnt infused missiles that don't have the best armor piercing ratio but can still slaughter armor based units through raw dog damage alone. These lads throw massive explosive missiles that devastate clumps of infantry in just a few short volleys no matter how tough they are. The downside of them is their low range and flat firing arc but you can seriously soften up enemy infantry on their approach making the job of your front lines and ranged infantry so much easier. Just set them up and target enemy infantry and as long as you keep them safe you can't go too far wrong. Now it comes to the regiments of renown. I'll call out each unit, what it's unit of and the differences between it and the base unit. First up we have the Ekrund Miners. These are a Blasting Charge Miners unit and gain attack, ammo and frenzy. Warriors of Dragonfire Pass are a Dwarf Warriors unit and gain flaming attacks and bonus versus infantry. The Grumbling Guard are a Great Weapons Longbeards unit and gain the old Grumblers ability. Dragonback Slayers are a Slayers unit and gain charge defense versus large, physical resistance and the power of the Dragonback ability. Peak Gate Guard are Hammerers units and gain armor sundering attacks and immune to psychology. Norm Grimlings Ironbreakers are Ironbreakers units and gain HP, 20 Entities, Vanguard deployments and immune to psychology. Ulthar's Raiders are Great Weapons Rangers and gain the marks by Ulthar ability. The Skald Guard are Iron Drakes and gain range, physical resistance and a massive amount of armor piercing damage at the cost of base missile damage. The Skyhammer is a Gyro Bomber and gains leadership and swaps the Gyro Bomber ability for the Skyhammer Bomb ability. And finally Goblobbers are Grudge Throwers and gain Discourage imbued attacks. Thoric also has a couple of units he can unlock via his artifacts. Hans Valhirsen is pretty similar to the two Ancestral Thane heroes with some slightly different stats but you can still use him pretty much the same as those two and it'll do just fine. And the Yoke's Kynosaur, which is basically an unbreakable feral Kynosaur without the Rampage from the Lizardmen. The Dwarf roster, it's a bit of a weird addition, but it does give you something fast to send around enemy lines to take out their ranged or a large monster to bolster the front lines. It's a powerhouse and the rolling monster unit, so it's good fun and unique. And finally we come to the army compositions. In Warhammer 3 every unit has a tier from 1 to 3. I'm going to be using these tiers to make you armies for the early, mid and late games so that you are set for every single step of your campaign. At tier 1 we're going to go over Rune Lord, 8 Dwarf Warriors, 8 Quarrelers and 3 Bolt Throwers. The Rune Lord is the clear Lord choice for me since the regular Lord is basically just a tanky guy and this guy isn't quite as tanky but can use runes in combat to actively assist his army which is pretty useful. Early on he'll do just fine in light combat but don't let him get into any duels if you can since he will most likely lose to most challengers. Just keep him at the back and cast him to get great value. The Dwarf Warriors are an excellent early game front line. They're super tanky, have shields and give your ranged units plenty of time to deal all the damage while they hold back most early game enemies with ease. The Quarrelers are the best range units you can get right now with great range and passable damage. Have them stand behind your melee troops to fire approaching enemies before changing targets to make sure they stay firing once the lines clash. Finally the Bolt Throws are here to do two things. Focus down large targets and make sure the enemy comes to you. Having a super long range unit like this means that most enemy armies will always move towards you which is exactly what we want as the Dwarves so this artillery is unfortunately a must. Coming in at tier 2 we've got the Rune Lord and we're now picking up a Master Engineer. We're going to go with 6 long bits for the front lines, 3 Iron Drakes, 3 Thunderers and 2 Trollhammer Torpedo Iron Drakes for the ranged, 2 Grudge Throwers and 2 Cannons for the artillery. The Rune Lord should have their runes on the go by now and be working towards that mount to reach their final form and sit in casting wherever possible. Master Engineer will be stood in as many of your ranged units as possible to grant them bonus effects from their passive and active abilities, as well as the odd bit of shooting of their own. The long beards are basically the same as Warriors, but are that much harder to get past so they'll hold the line excellently in the mid game. Iron Drake's going to wipe out entire swarms of enemy infantry if they can get a clear shot, so get them one and enjoy massive kill counts. Thunderers will focus down armor targets from range and cut through their armor and wipe out key targets in moments. I was going to go with Brimstone Gyrocopters, but I just couldn't as there are too many flies in the game right now to use them safely. 
The torpedoes are a safer bet and will function as large target killers, but nothing more. Use them to focus the beefiest targets you can find, and they'll get plenty of value. Grudge throws are there to soften up infantry clumps on the approach, and cannons are there to do the same with large targets with those massive armor-piercing damage shots. And finally we come to tier 3, we're going to have the Rune Lord, the Master Engineer, 6 Iron Breakers, 3 Iron Drakes, 3 Thunderers, 2 Trollhammer Torpedo Iron Drakes, then 2 Organ Gunners, and 2 Flame Cannons. The Rune Lords will be in final form, so have all the runes to be cast on cooldown for a ton of value. Master Engineer will also have all their abilities, so will be able to provide a ton of buffs to nearby ranged units. Iron Breakers are the best wall of defense in the game, and with those explosive packs they can tear apart anything that comes close to them and make the falling combat a walk in the park. Using them the same as you have the two other front lines, but now just enjoy a nice burst of damage just before the lines clash. No change to the ranged infantry, since it can't get any better, and the artillery is seen a direct upgrade to both pieces. The organ guns will have slightly less range, but their damage is outstanding, and they can melt even the most armored units in the game in just a few volleys. The flame cannons will do excellent damage to infantry on their approach and blow clumps to smithereens, making it all the easier to beat them if they even manage to reach the front lines. Yes, all these armies are incredibly reliant on ranged, but if you use them correctly, the enemy shouldn't even get close to you before you wipe them out. And that's everything you need to know to play the dwarves in battle. We've got the Lizardmen campaign guide coming out next week, so subscribe if you want to see that. Come to see it 50k by the end of the year, so I would appreciate the assistance. If you enjoyed this video and or found it useful, then consider dropping it a like. If you really enjoy the content and want to support it directly, then consider becoming a member on YouTube or a patron on the Patreon. Doing so gets you early insights into future content, increased voting power and discounts on merch, as well as shout outs at the end of videos like Henry Tucker for his spot at the officer's tier. Thank you to all supporters, one last thank you for watching, and for now, I've been Colonel Damders, and I will see you next turn.